Hi, I'm Adam German from realestate.co.jp, welcoming you to another one of our webcasts. Uh, we're here with Ziv Megen, uh, manager of Asia Pacific at Nippon Tradings International, a real estate investment proxy agency based out of Fukuoka. And he's come all the way up here to Tokyo to tell us what's going on in, in the investment world outside of Tokyo in terms of real estate, all the opportunities that are there. And I'm very excited for this. But before we get into that, I want to thank the Queensland Business Center uh, for allowing us to film here on their, on, their lug, on their great location here, right on top of Kamiacho Station in the heart of Tokyo's business district. Uh, if you're looking to uh, enter into, to into Japan and you're looking for very, very inexpensive uh, but professional uh, office space and shared office space, then these guys are the people you want to call. Uh, very affordable rates uh, with a great location. And throughout, while we're talking to Ziv, uh, you'll notice on the screen behind Ziv there is uh, some phone numbers and some contact information. If you are interested in coming to uh, Tokyo and interested in entering the market here, then give these guys a call. They're the first stop on any office entry into Japan. All right. And without further ado, let's get into it. Ziv, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thank you. And where? tell us about Nippon Tradings International. How did it start? Uh, what are its beginnings? Well, um, I'm originally an Australian, and um, the way Nippon Trading started really is um, by myself investing in real estate, or rather looking for real estate investments. Um, I had a few markets in mind, being Asia-Pacific oriented, I was looking at Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, more or less regulated environments where I wouldn't have to be uh, cutting deals under tables and stuff. And um, Japan just won hands down as far as the, um, as far as the cash flow was concerned. I'm not much of a speculator by nature, so um, my wife was Japanese, which made it also um, a lot easier considering the uh, culture and the language. And uh, once we purchased a few uh, properties for ourselves, and we saw how um, how lucrative it was and how easily manageable it was from our perspective, we just thought, well, hey, there's quite a few people that might be interested in this. So that was pretty much it. And how long have, have you been at it? Just about three years now. About three years? Yeah. Okay, so you started at a very challenging time in the market. In the global market, for yes. Global for Japan specifically, it wasn't actually that much of a challenging times. And with real estate, challenging times are where the good deals are found. So it wasn't such a uh, stretch. And why Fukuoka? Well, when we were looking around the country, Fukuoka had a few things going for it. Um, one was, um, well, we started off away from the main cities, um, not focusing on Tokyo and Osaka. Um, a little bit at Nagoya we were looking, but um, just looking for the higher cash flow. Um, I mean, until very recently, one would not be going to Japan for um, capital gain or capital growth. So cash flow was what we were looking at. Um, Fukuoka provided that sort of high-level cash flow on the residential front um, with the lowest vacancy rates of the places that we were looking at. And also, um, in sharp contrast to the rest of Japan, Fukuoka has actually got a growing population. Um, it's grown, I think, 9% in 2010, and it's um, the core families, which is um, couples with young children, are actually on the up. The governor is a very advanced, progressive sort of chap. Well, I want to I want to get into that a little later, uh, yeah. but before we get to, before we get into that, because that's a very very important point. Um, you know, increased population equals a sustainable return. That's right. Uh, but so you started in Fukuoka, and then now you cover the rest of the country. Not all of the country. Uh, basically, what we do is we go where the good deals are from our perspective, which would mean um, a place that has a good sustainable tenant base and that provides the cash flow that we're looking for. Um, we mostly represent foreign investors, people who have not necessarily been to Japan or have only been to visit. They don't live here. They're not even going to come and attend in person in most cases. Um, so these sort of investors usually would not venture out of their backyards for less than 10%. So that's, the, that's really the sort of returns that we've been looking and we've been following the deals wherever in Japan they may be. And so what areas are hot right now? Fukuoka is still very hot. It's getting a bit harder to find good deals there, um, but still quite, quite hot. Um, Kumamoto a little bit further down south. Um, these are probably the areas that um, large parts of Southeast Asia are already familiar with, but the Western world not not as much. Is that because of the geographic location? I mean, because Fukuoka, for those for viewers who are unaware, is, is very far in the west. It is uh, in Japan. It so is. It's actually it, close to Taiwan and so, closer to Taiwan and South Korea than it is to Tokyo. 
is it is it because mainly of geographic location that that East Asian uh, investors are attracted to the to that area more than Western people? Or? That's right. And Kumamoto specifically, but Fukuoka is a city. The whole the whole Kyushu landmass um, is quite popular with the people from Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, they come there for a Japanese adventure without having to venture too far east to Tokyo, and they've got beautiful onsens around Oita and Kumamoto, and Fukuoka itself is quite a large city. It's a million and a half population, I think seventh largest in Japan at last count. So it's a big holiday destination for some of them, and people who have been coming back year after year, eventually, um, if they're business types, they would be looking at property investment there. Okay, so basically, to, you're you're selling property, uh, investment property, to foreign foreign people to rent out to Japanese people. Yes, already tenanted in most cases, unless somebody specifically asks for a vacant unit. Okay, and and what kind of what kind of prices are we talking about in terms of picking up uh, one of these properties that if you don't get at least a ten percent, you're not going to look at it, kind of a deal. Well, we accommodate all budgets, uh, but we found that if you want to keep the returns above 10%, you're looking at the smaller, older mansion types, um, buildings built 1974 to 95, one room or 1DK tops, and these would usually run in Fukuoka City between 2.5 million to 5 million yen. Nihakuman up to Gohakuman yen. Okay, which is basically about uh, 20,000 20, US dollars, 30,000 US dollars. That's right, yeah. And what do they rent out at in hard numbers? Um, well, before you take off all the mansion fees, etc., you're probably looking at um, a typical... I've got some samples here, actually. If Why don't we take a look? Yeah. Yep, yeah, if we have a sample property, can, uh, if we can get the camera to, to zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this one's actually not in Fukuoka. This one's in Sapporo, which is uh, another one of the hotspots that we haven't actually touched on yet. Okay. Um, but a very similar profile, still a little bit cheaper. Fukuoka has actually gone up in price now. So you can see that the purchase price for this one would be a million. Oh, you mean Sapporo, Sapporo's have gone up in price? No, no, Fukuoka has gone up in price. Sapporo oh, okay. is um, still suffering from uh, post 311 uh, down prices, but transactions have picked up. Okay. So I think prices will definitely be uh, going up there very quickly. Interesting. Yeah, they've been snatched within days, the Sapporo units, actually. A lot faster than Fukuoka these days. But prices have still not gone up as they have in Fukuoka. So you can see the buy price here is a million eighty-five. The actual rent paid is 42,000 yen a month. Then you've got your costs. So you'd be paying your insurance, which is really a little bit of a joke in Japan. Um, 108 yen, etc. You'll be paying your uh, chinta, your property manager. You'll be paying the buddy corp fees, what we call them in Australia, which is uh, composed of your management fee for managing the block and your accumulated funds fee, which is um, what Westerners usually call the reno repair or sink, sink fund pool, money collected uh, for any future uh, renovations or repairs required on the building. And then you've got our fee for management, uh, which brings you down to just over... 23,000 yen per month for 12.5% roundabout. Okay. And this is an initial calculator, so we're assuming worst case purchase costs. Actually, it usually gets a little bit better closer to settlement, but we, uh, we want to make sure that the numbers work even in worst case mode before we proceed. And this, the, these numbers here, just to make, just to make absolutely clear, these, you're talking about buying one, one K unit, one studio unit, not the building. This one particularly is a one DK, yes. It's a one DK, okay. Yeah. So you're talking about buying, this is the returns and the type of, of returns you can get on a one unit within That's right. a, condo, a condominium complex. Right, or, this one's a fairly small one, 45 units, and they go up as most Japanese condos do 100 or 200 units or so. Okay. And... That's interesting because it's it's you talk Tokyo has very similar uh, a very similar way of thinking. The best returns are on the exact same type of properties, yep. and you're saying basically all the way from Sapporo down to Fukuoka, um, it's the same kind of principle that an outside investor should be looking at. Then, yes, that's right. I mean, um, Sapporo, Fukuoka, Nagoya has been uh, where we've been finding a few good deals recently. Um, Gifu, Kumamoto. Um, that's roughly it for the bigger cities. There are um, smaller, more blue-collar type towns where you can even get higher returns than that, closer to 15%, 16%. Any specific reason why? Um, they're just not popular. Um, Population is on sharp decline. Um, people there could be shift workers, part-time workers, government-supported tenants. So 
they're not a problematic population. I mean, they're still Japanese. They wouldn't trash an apartment or, you know, invite the whole family to live in there and have drug parties in there. But um, they could occasionally um, lose their job. They could occasionally um, be forced to move out because they can't pay. So Okay, so the higher rate of return you'll find there is actually not, on a cash flow basis, sustainable in your opinion because the purchase price is lower. But the existing tenants, you might not find a new tenant if someone leaves. It would take longer. Okay. Um, again, this is Japan, so it's not as drastic as it might be in other countries. Um, for instance, a lot of our clients are either um, people who have already purchased in the USA um, since the global financial crisis hit, or um, the USA, um, pardon me, disappointees, we like to call them, people who have uh, been burned by um, ghetto properties, war zone properties, places that they purchased and then were staying, standing empty for years. So. This sort of thing doesn't happen in Japan. I mean, the worst that we had to wait so far would be two, three months to populate the property, even in those bad towns. Um, but they could be shorter tenancies. So if your average Japanese salaryman sort of tenant would stay um, four to five years, your average single female over 30 would stay a lot longer, and that could be up to 10, 15, sometimes 19 years. Um, in Kita Kyushu, for example, which is um, Kyushu's um, industrial hub, so to speak, you could be looking at a year to two and a half years average tenancy. So still sustainable, but over the long term, you want to calculate a few more vacancy costs. Um, whenever a tenant moves out, you've got a few more cleanup costs, just stuff that would um, probably reduce the paper figure that you'll be seeing at the start of the deal to something a bit more practical down the track. So they would still probably average at around the 12 to 13 at most. So not much of a difference, and if it's not much of a difference, I'd rather buy in a central city. Interesting. And and speak, coming back to central cities, I mean, the, here in Tokyo, the population is growing despite the overall uh, population decline in Japan. That's right. Earlier, you touched on Fukuoka City as well, that uh, families, the population is growing, and plus, you had mentioned earlier that there's, some, there's more family um, creation. I guess yes. more than any other, more than more than any other city, even Tokyo. Yes. Can you elaborate a bit on that and why that why that specifically is an opportunity in that city? Um, why it's happening is probably there's a few good reasons for it. Um, most recently, post three eleven, um, there was talk of official um, official uh, um, uh, survivors relocations to Kyushu. Whether that's happened officially, I'm not too sure because it hasn't been advertised, but we have seen a lot of um, informal migration. Um, so salarymen that used to try to avoid the relocation have suddenly applied for relocation. They wanted to move with their family to Kyushu. You had a lot of people, um, small business owners, that if they could afford to uh, uproot their business and take it elsewhere, they also moved to Kyushu. So a lot of people that could afford to and could actually... Um, offer a sort of better life to their family past Tohoku, actually ended up settling in Fukuoka. And you've got a lot of temporary workers there. It's known as the branch city of Japan. A lot of the big company headquarters have opened up branches in Fukuoka. So you've got a lot of um, um, weekly workers coming in and going out. They need a place to stay as well. Um, so company rent out, head, um, rent out their residential properties for their own employees. Um, you've got a fair bit of temporary workers from Korea and China coming in on occasion. They also need residents. They've got their own little coups and neighborhoods in Fukuoka as well. So quite, um, I would say, if you go past Osaka and Kyoto further west, Fukuoka is probably Western Japan's um, biggest city and also sort of um, um, trade hub, if you will, for the rest of Asia. So it's happening there to some extent some people um, seem to think it's been happening a little bit too much there um, but yeah definitely a vibrant place at the moment where do you, what areas do you see being hot in five years from now uh, and where are you personally going to look for investment opportunities in the same time frame that's a tough one five years in the future um, we've positioned so far we've positioned this ourselves um, personally our family portfolio in the same sort of places that we've been speaking about so far um, Fukuoka, Kumamoto, Sapporo, Nagoya, um, Kurume which is a little city just a little bit south of Fukuoka down the track is hard to say a lot of it would depend I think with what happens with Fukushima um, if the situation seems to be under control I think as I mentioned that Sapporo will be on the up definitely um, but whenever 
The thing with Hokkaido is it's um, it's very internationally dependent. So once the um, ski holiday makers stop coming for any reasons, the people who support them and live there as as um, as uh, holiday workers will also tend to peter off. And that's what's been happening post 311. If Fukushima is kept under control, I think Sapporo will rise again. It's definitely been a very hot destination before 311. There's no reason for it not to go back up there. So there's quite good deals there at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Speaking of speaking of, you touched a bit on it on, on ski resorts areas, and you're specifically talking about Niseko. Um, what are you? Not, not me. I'm not buying in Niseko. Sapporo. Oh, I know, but I mean, when you're talking about uh, tourism and ski destinations, that's that right. Yeah, Niseko. I just wanted to. I, we've had we've done a lot of focus on Niseko on realestate.co.jp uh, for the reason that uh, it's a great case study. It's the most advanced case study of foreign involvement. Uh, in town planning and That's how right. and 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 how far it can go. What what are your personal thoughts on Niseko? Is it is it a sustain? Is there a future there? Is there other? Is it a good model to to put in other parts of the country? And if so, where? Administration wise, I would definitely think so. Um, I think Fukuoka has a lot to learn from the way they've been doing it there because they are aspiring to be an international hub. They've gotten a good start to it. Um, there's a, I think, a Australian consulate, American consulate, Italian chamber of commerce, a, a French. So, so they're definitely um, moving up that way. Um, still a long way to go, though. I mean, um, today, for example, at the airport, I've noticed Fukuoka has got an international airport. If you're sitting in the domestic terminal to take a flight to Tokyo, there's not a single English announcement on the speakers, for example, which struck me as a bit odd. Um, so I think they're still working their heads around on how exactly to do it. They could definitely take notes from Niseko, I think. Um, but they also need to watch out because Niseko has been a little bit bubbly, I think, as far as property is concerned. Um, with the amount of um, um, holiday makers purchasing houses there, then trying to rent them out throughout the rest of the year, I think property there is probably a little bit too high for its own good. So they, they, they are walking a little bit of a thin line there. A lot of it's based on tourism as well. That's got, right. uh, like you say, they're, one of the big push there is they're trying to make the summer uh, as desirable to, yeah. to as a desirable of a season as the winter is up there with the, with the fresh powder snow. Um, and touching on public relations, uh, basically, what's the most important thing that Japan's real estate market overall, from all the way from the north, from the east, all the way to the further, for, further, uh, the farthest west? What's the what's the what's the most important thing that the industry can do to further internationalize itself? Oh, God, where to start? <laughs> um, look, Tokyo's done a good job. Um, Niseko's done a good job. The rest of the country has done absolutely nothing from my perspective. Um, agents don't speak English. Not only do they not speak English, they're afraid of foreigners. Um, even if you walk in there and you do speak Japanese, um, just the fact that you are not physically Japanese, um, a lot of the time will put them off. Is that a big thing outside of, I mean, for Tokyo-centric uh, investors and, and potential investors, it does, it's not that big of a problem so much these days, no. but if you're looking at the rest of the country, is that, even if you, is that still a big problem for that the buyer is a foreign person? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Osaka is probably the only other place aside from Tokyo and Iseko where you'd be able to comfortably operate in an English-speaking environment, or even if you do speak Japanese and are a foreigner, you'll be able to operate comfortably. Um, other places, absolutely not, zero. I'm not, not too familiar with Okinawa. It might be different there with the U.S. presence there. Um, but as for the rest of the country, um, there are agents that deal specifically with Chinese. Um, so you could find the occasional um, Chinese-oriented realtor. But most of them, um, if you're not Japanese, would just steer clear of you. So it's a little bit of a boon and a blessing for us as a company that actually provides those realtors with a Japanese entity to deal with. So we managed to bridge that gap um, for them and for the foreign investors. On the other hand, um, it's a lot of hard work because aside from Tokyo and Niseko, Japan is just, until the last two years or so, has been virtually unknown as a, as a property investment destination. And it's ridiculous because it's Asia's biggest. So I think if the government and the real estate industry were to focus on generating the PR that they're currently only getting secondhand, so since late 2011, a lot of foreign funds, um, a lot of um, insurance companies, a lot of um, investment bankers have been purchasing in Tokyo because they've been seeing signs of a potential revival. 
they've been generating PR for Japan and for Japan's real estate um, industry and some of the local realtors are benefiting from that but a lot of them wouldn't have anything to do with it even when it's not them who had to do the work so there's a little bit of training and a little bit of um, organized PR efforts to be done I'd say. Speaking of PR though is is the Tokyo 2020 Olympics announcement that and from here to the next seven years yep um, is that going to have any? Is that going to have any effect on what you're saying there? Is it going to make it more positive? Is it going to attract more international attention? Maybe specifically in this area, I in would the real estate area, and would, would it bleed outside of Tokyo? I would say indirectly, definitely. I mean, um, the thing with Japan is that unless you've been exposed to it in the past, for most people, Japan is yet another Asian country. So they are not aware of how different it is to the rest of Asia in the sense of how regulated and a stable, honest environment Japan is if you compare it to other countries in Asia. Um, I think maybe Singapore is the only comparable regulated environment that you can find. Most countries um, in Asia are, um, how should we put it, more loosely regulated and uh, you a little bit more likely to get screwed over if you if you operate in another country. Japan is just the exact opposite of that. It's probably more akin to um, Germany than it is to any other country in Asia in that respect. So once people come in for a big event like the Olympics and they stay here, they get exposed to the culture, they realize that um, how different it is from what they've been imagining, then yes, it would generate interest. As far as direct profit for the industry is involved, it's hard to say. I mean, studies that I've been reading haven't been able to directly correlate any economic benefit with the Olympic Games, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. Because, I mean, not only are the people coming here, you've got the events broadcasted throughout the world, and naturally when they do that, they also um, quickly uh, survey the customs and the traditions and uh, they interview people. So. Definitely on a temporary basis, I think it will give it a bit of a pickup. And once again, this a lot of it depends on what happens with Fukushima. What what happens in your in your opinion? You mentioned that a couple of times about Fukushima. In your opinion, what's the best case scenario for Fukushima? Ah, no more news would be good. At the moment, we seem to be hearing only bad news. Every once in a while, there's a little bit of a leak here, a bigger leak there. Um, somebody's head rolls, another one comes in. Um, for a nationalized effort uh, of having taken over TEPCO or virtually taken over TEPCO, I don't think that too much has advanced. So I think until officially and publicly international experts of serious magnitude are allowed to come in and participate and um, the authorities handling this loosen up the um, secrecy veil a little bit, um, that would be great news, but until that happens, I think, um, well, people are waiting to hear anything. So as soon as foreign media catches a drift of anything, and it's usually unfortunately bad news because they've been keeping everything close to their chest, everything else, um, it's just not doing well for business. When, when, you, when you talk to a first-time client, do they ask about effects of Fukushima on places like, areas like Fukuoka or uh, Kyushu or up in Hokkaido? The ones that know Japan usually have a question or two. Most people, I think, don't see this as a problem even once you get past the actual Fukushima um, prefecture itself. Most people don't actually tend to think that it could um, eventuate to anything in other parts of the country. And once the actual impact of the, of the big uh, news item has passed, then most of them tend to forget, to be honest with you. They're more concerned with earthquake insurance than they are with Fukushima. But for me, um, as a person who does live here and is involved in what's happening, I know that um, if things do get bad there, it will undoubtedly affect other parts of the country. So I'm, I guess I'm more concerned on, on long term than uh, first time clients are. And are you long on Japan? Well, I, I've married into the country. My son's going to Yochi in here, so um, I'm um, I'm a Japanophiliac in the sense that I've I've got a lot of faith in in Japan's people, not necessarily any particular government or or corporate figure, but I think that the people will prevail. Whatever happens to them, even if the economy drops, uh, I think they will they will be on the rebound before too long. And property investment. Like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not much of a speculator. So for me, property investment is a long-term deal. So I'm in it for the long year. 
And and speaking of people, which which ultimately are the tenants of investment properties, yep. is there a difference between? Uh, is there any regional differences between tenants? Say, for example, Hokkaido tenants uh, act in one way, Kitakyushu tenants act another way. Um, are there any regional differences between uh, the type of tenants that an investor can expect, or is it basically kind of what the image is out there um, of calm, quiet, clean, on-time Japanese tenants? Definitely, most of them are like that. I don't think there's any behavioral difference. Um, there might be, like we mentioned earlier, um, just due to um, the course of what they actually do for work or... Um, I suppose if you take a government-supported tenants, um, some of them are just elderly or disabled or physically disabled, but some of them could be mentally disabled or an ex-homeless person. They could be a little bit less cleaner than your average tenant, I suppose, but or they could abscond. But most of them come with um, with guarantee, uh, chintai guarantees, so you're not really majorly harmed by that. The main difference, um, depending on the type of industry that the town specializes in, um, would be in the length of the tenancy. Okay. And, and that actually brings up a good point, is government guaranteed tenancy. Is that, is that a potential... How prevalent is that outside of Tokyo? No, well, the government guarantee doesn't come in the form of a guarantee. It's more in the form of a threat to the government-supported tenant in the sense that if the, um, if the Chintai reports that he hasn't paid his rent, then he will lose his government support. So that's a very strong deterrent for them to keep paying. Um, the gov the uh, guarantees that they do come up with is um, in cases where they cannot afford to pay the shikiki in the security deposit or if they cannot get a guarantor in the form of a family member or an employer, then they're forced to sign up with a guarantee company. And even for the homeless people that cannot afford to sign up with these sort of companies, there are NPOs that provide this sort of service for them to a point. Um, so it's a little bit of a um, mitigating factor for the investor in the sense that uh, for example, when we had one, um, we had one government-supported tenant that ended up absconding. Um, whether he absconded on day one or three months down the track, we don't even know because we only heard about that once the guarantee company has notified the property manager that they haven't been paid for three months. So you just keep getting the money until they move out. The guarantee company uh, also covers for the um, the price of the cleaning. They also cover for the price of going to court to remove their stuff from the apartment if they're no longer there or force of, um, forced removal if they're no longer there, so if they, they no longer pay. So it's a bit of less of a headache for the investor. But still, to have an apartment occupied for three months, then vacant for three months, and occupied again for three months, you want to avoid this sort of thing if you can. Okay. And, and I'm thinking not so much in terms of homeless people or anything like that, but actually the elderly, because in, in, out, in outside of metropolitan areas, elderly numbers are increasing. Oh, they're um, perfect, perfect tenants. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Not a, not never miss a beat. And the guarantor, the guarantor, if they can't find their own guarantor, this MPO guarantors, how far? And for those viewers who don't uh, understand the term guarantor company, is basically third-party insurance that acts in lieu of a co-signer right. uh, for an apartment uh, for for situations like this. How different is an MPO guarantor company versus someone say like Recruit or like a mainstream? Insurance, uh, no, no, from our perspective as investors, no difference whatsoever. So providing the same coverage to the that's owner, right. providing the same protections. Up to three months. I think that's what the uh, the mainline ones do as well. So up to three months. Okay, excellent. Yeah, excellent. What would you? What's the best thing a first time investor can do to prepare for building a successful real estate portfolio in Japan? We've kind of covered a, kind of a lot of it so far. But is there anything else that you'd wanna that you'd wanna give to first time investors here? I would say that if they are looking to operate out of the heart of Tokyo or Osaka or Niseko, um, then they probably want to get themselves some Japanese partners. So if they don't have um, family members who can dedicate a fair amount of time to the task, or if they don't have any um, friends or anybody who is Japanese and living in Japan, then they had better make some contacts, either sign up with a company like us or just go out there and find a partner, maybe a business partner or a um, part-time employee that they can pay occasionally who can um, contact the realtors for them, who can conduct the due diligence process for them and who either knows what questions to ask or can be instructed. Um, 
because if you try to go it yourself as a guy kokujin even if you're very japan oriented you'll just find that a lot of them will have a problem to work with you um they just out of tokyo and osaka they often prefer or the vast majority of them i would say prefer to work with japanese people so if you don't have a japanese face to present to them you might be in a bit of a um, a bit of a jam i mean you'll be very limited in your selection of properties however uh, nippon trading is international Yes, we can do that for you. You do all of that. You can you can take care of all of that and no, no matter where the no matter where the property is. Yes, that's right. So for our Japan-based clients, we conduct the purchase due diligence, sales if they require, and um, we can or we do not have to, it's up to them, conduct the monthly management for them. So the busier ones who just cannot be bothered to um, talk to a property manager or collect the rent by themselves, etc., we can do all of that for them. Um for the foreign buyers who um, are not Japanese residents um of course we do the monthly management as well so we organize for the insurance um conduct the uh, relationships with the property managers um help them make decisions on tenants if an apartment becomes vacant and they need to find a new one um and financial management because unless you're very lucky it's quite difficult for non-residents to open a bank account in Japan So we also collect the rent for you and transfer it to your account of choice whenever um there's a substantial amount to be transferred or whenever exchange rates are profitable it's really up to you. Oh yeah, so it's, it's you guys provide a complete hands-off service then Absolutely, if if yeah. necessary. One stop shop. One stop shop. Okay, that's right. and that's outside of Tokyo anywhere in the country. Yeah, oh, we can get you properties in Tokyo too if you want. We just um the cash flow is not that good. No offense, I know you guys are Tokyo centric, but um Yeah, we prefer other Well, places. we're Tokyo centric to up to a certain point. I mean, yeah. we do want to we would do want to cover the whole country too. Yeah. Um but yes, at the moment the mo- the majority of our listings from uh the agents that we work with are in Tokyo, although we like we're starting to get more and more outside of Tokyo. And it's sh- and it's really surprising to see um a lot higher of a cap rate in places like Kyoto or in places yeah. like it's just it, my experience as a realtor is in Tokyo. Um and just seeing instead of like you know you don't look at anything under 10 I've seen things listed for you know 15 17%. Yep. So in, right. in some places so it's just jaw dropping on a cash flow basis. Yeah. Um I want to before we get to um some questions that uh, some registrants had wanted to ask you specifically I wanted to touch on financing and just touch briefly on it. Okay. What options are there if any for foreign people to qualify for financing here in Japan? at present foreign as in non-permanent residents uh non-permanent re- let's start with let's start with permanent residents and work backwards see how i'm moving forward because that's a little bit of an uncomfortable subject and um, <laughs> we're getting a lot of um, inquiries on that and um recently we've been led to believe that shinsei bank might be one of the more foreigner friendly banks so we'll definitely try to go into contact with them to organize something Um but as far as we've been able to ascertain until now if you're not a permanent resident of Japan with at least 6 years living here and 5 years working here um you would be very hard pressed to get any sort of finance in Japan what most of our clients do is um when they arrive into the Japanese market from our perspective they're cash buyers but what a lot of them do is they organize for personal loans if they need to in their country of origin um the ones that go for really hard of the city newer properties where the returns are might be a little bit lower than 10% then they can get finance from banks like HSBC Citibank any of the interna- international banks um that do that sort of thing but these guys really want to see um capital growth potential um the fact that it's japan and there's not much of it happening so far um doesn't actually doesn't actually deter them they are they will only loan against um half million dollarish apartments in the heart of Tokyo kind of thing. So specifically for investment purposes. Yes, that's right. Okay. Cuz cuz one one registrant had asked a question. Now they're not permanent residents, so we can we're kind of working backwards here. Yeah. Um I'm in the Navy and just received orders uh, back to Japan to come back to Japan, specifically Yokosuka and Kanagawa. Until at least 2017 and thereafter started planning on staying in for life if possible. When you say they his spouse is Japanese is she? Is yep, spouse well, is that's Japanese. That's a permanent resident that you can get. Yep, spouse is Japanese yeah. and what are the what's the first step in buying or building a house? Uh, they have $100,000 in savings and are the banks willing to lend money to a person like this? 
I think if his wife is earning, it should be a lot easier. If she's not earning or haven't earned in Japan, and he's the only uh, breadwinner or um, head of the house, as they call it in the Koseki Tohon, then he will need to show some um, long-lasting income here. So probably not if he's stationed till 2017. He might be just reaching his eligibility about then. Um, what? I know that it's difficult for a lot of um, owner occupiers to wrap their head around this, but my suggestion is always, um, as shocking as it may sound, is take your $100,000, invest it cash in investment properties, and use that incoming cash flow and cash stream to either prove your income a lot faster or prove that you're a um, semi-mogul real estate investor, which should be getting a loan, um, or alternatively, just rent to live. I mean, rent your dream home and just invest your money without debt in something that actually generates income and pays off your rent plus. Great advice. So basically, don't, don't, don't go for the loan off the bat. Build a track record here. I would say so, yeah. Using your savings to, generate, to buy the first couple of properties. I would say so, yeah. Would you, would you buy the properties in your name or would you, would you advise this person to uh, uh, buy the property in their name or should they start a company? Um, a corporate entity in Japan until you hit the um, I think several good tens of thousands property related income per year there's not much of an advantage to owning it under a corporate structure and the corporate maintenance would cost you probably more than you'll be saving if you will be so I wouldn't see much of an advantage now and um, potentially if his wife is not working um, and the um, they're probably eligible to some sort of at least minimal government support on her end of things. So he could potentially be looking at a situation where it would be better off to purchase under both their names and claim as much as they can. Um, also, you can claim purchase costs. You can claim um, you can claim um, depreciation for the first four or five years from memory. I mean. I'm not an accountant, but just going off what our accountant tells us in most cases. So and claiming it on other earned income, such as employment that's right. income or that's right. to, so to offset a tax burden. It's burden. probably more advantageous until you hear, hit the bigger portfolios to actually keep it in the family sort of thing. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Speaking of families, uh, another registrant had asked a different question. Yep. Uh, again, my wife is Japanese. Uh, I'm semi-retired, and what little consultancy work I will get in the future will relate to Japan. Uh, this viewer is from the UK, and ideally we'd like to sell our big UK house and purchase apartments in both Japan and the UK to live part-time in both. Does it make economic sense to purchase an apartment in Japan and only live there, say, six months of the year? Six months of the year is a very long time to be renting a weekly mansion for. Um, I would say absolutely. Um, of course, it would depend on the requirements. I mean, if they're usually staying at the Hilton, it'll be tough to purchase this kind of property from liquidating the UK house. But if they're um, reasonably medium to upper medium um, lifestyle family, then they should be able to save a lot of money by purchasing. Um, not only, not only is it. Uh, worth leaving it empty, but there are actually companies out there that will do weekly mansion renting of your house for you when you're not here. So, now let's talk about weekly mansions. That that basically what you're saying provides a much much higher rate of return in a shorter period of time because a standard leasing contract in Japan is two years, yes. and we're not talking about short term is anything under two years here. If you can keep it occupied, yes. If you can keep it occupied, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's a big yep. if. Yeah. Okay. But. Um, uh, we did the same sort of um, calculation for my mother just recently because um, now that we're living here permanently, she's coming to visit a lot more. And we worked out that I think if she plans to stay longer than three months a year, it's already worth it to buy an apartment even if it stands empty. Wow, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So Again, she's got low demand. I don't know what their life, what sort of lifestyle they're used to. Um, but... Um, Okay. If they're not too high of a maintenance person, then they should be able to definitely make it profitable, um, even without renting it out. And there's always the option of renting it out. These companies will actually let you, um, there's a few schemes that you can enter with them. So they'll actually offer one option where they will pay you a monthly fee regardless of whether the property is tenanted or not, a sort of uh, as if you've been renting it out long term. So in effect, a sublease. Almost. That's right. And then when you want to use the property, whether it's six months, four months, three months, then they'll 
charge you or debit you from your um, yearly balance with them um, a discounted amount. So you'll be sort of renting your own property from yourself kind of thing, but you'll have the assurance of getting um, regular income all throughout the year. What kind, of, what kind of yield would that provide? Do those companies provide? Is it on a percentage base? It is on a percentage base. So even 7%, 8%? I would not know that. Uh, we haven't worked with them closely. Okay. Um, but it was, we've only got one quote um, from memory and it was quite reasonable. I couldn't tell you the exact figure. Or they can do just plain out holiday lease for you and then they'll, um, they'll only charge you when they actually lease the place. Okay. And they're good at it. I mean, if, if there are weekly mansions to be had, then um, they'll definitely rent it out for you. But they'll only take you if your apartment is very centrally located, obviously. I mean, uh, if they know that they'll have a hard time leasing it out on a temporary basis, they won't do it. Okay, so they'll be straight up with you at the very beginning definitely. saying, we, yeah. can't, we can or cannot do this. That's right. And you'll want to target the central area as well, because weekly mansions are basically um, business people and holiday makers, and these guys, they don't want to stay out of town, they want to stay in the heart of town. So that's a, that's a really good point for this person in the UK, that if you're going to buy something that could potentially be empty for six months, that you want to lease as a holiday rental, for example, or a weekly rental, then you have to put it in a desired location by a for, those, for those two types of tenants. I would say buy a centrally located property, even if it's an older block, and look for a well-maintained block. Basically, you know, if the management fee is fairly high, then it's most likely a well-maintained block. And put your money into renovating the inside of it so it's as close to a luxurious hotel room as you can get. And then it'll be quite easy to rent out when you're not here. Okay. Excellent. Uh, moving on to another registrant's question. Um, I'm 28 years old. I'm a 28 years old uh, U.S. national working full-time with a global company in Tokyo for the past six years. So we've got some history here. I want to get very involved in real estate investment. However, I'm not exactly sure how to get started in my position for real estate in Tokyo, Kanto, or Japan, anywhere. The question is, for someone under 30 who's a foreigner, what are the key challenges uh, that must be overcome specifically for Japan, and what would you recommend uh, for someone in this position? Someone under 30, been here six years. Yeah. Um, is it difficult for a full-time worker to get a mortgage with a bank in this case? We touched on this briefly. Uh, earlier, but I in a specifically in a younger single person's case, I shouldn't saying? think so. I think he might be going off information that might have been correct um, maybe six, seven, eight years ago. I think it's the under thirty thing is not really that much of an obstacle from what I hear. Um, again, we deal mostly with cash buyers, so this is not our area of expertise. Um, six years of employment in Japan should definitely give him a foot up. Um, his residency status would be the biggest thing. So if he's in a constantly renewable sort of work contract that's only being renewed for one year at a time, um, again, I would recommend Shinsei Bank um, from word of mouth. Again, I haven't worked with them personally, but from word of mouth, they're the, um, the ones who he's probably got the best chance of working it out with. You mentioned uh, what type of, what type of uh, work permit he's here under. Uh, last year, the Japanese government re uh, Re oh, the first revamp of the immigration law. Exactly, yep. and yep. that introduced uh, a five-year visa. Yep. It, does that have any effect, any positive impact on people without permanent residencies' chances of getting a loan here in Japan now that there's a longer visa? Yeah, look, that's uh, been introduced. Bank officials are just people that the ones actually making the decisions. They've got their set of rules and they've got their um, um, little tick boxes that they need to tick around tick, but they're they are basically got a fair bit of leeway in the decision-making process. So if they see that he's here and his visa has constantly been renewed or he's got a five-year visa or, I mean, they're not likely to have to chase him around the world to pay them back or they'll be very easy to foreclose on the property if they do, they're most likely to give him that loan, I'd say. And again, you want to approach the bigger international banks. I mean, um, a local branch of... Um, I don't know, what have you got in Tokyo? A small neighborhood bank will probably not do it for you, but the bigger ones will. Okay. And where would you recommend this person's first time, first time uh, potential purchaser? Where's the safest place that you would recommend for someone in this, in this case? Well, he's not going to get a mortgage for investment purpose um, anywhere out of the heart of Tokyo, um, which again, I wouldn't recommend for cash flow, but if he's looking at potential growth, that's probably a good place to be. Um, Growth uh, in terms of gaining a track record with that with that lender in order to buy other properties. No growth in in terms of potential capital capital growth. Ah, okay. Um, track record for uh, future property purchases. 
as long as he's generating cash flow, he's going to have a track record. So that's not that much of an issue. And um, in Tokyo, you can definitely keep the apartment tenanted, so that shouldn't be a big, a big problem. Um, but if he does want to generate a reasonable income from it and not just stay um, on top of um, inflation or just a little bit better than a term deposit, then I'd offer to go out of Tokyo. I mean, consider that people who are living here as foreigners um, have got the big advantage of uh, being able to channel their money around out of Japan rather freely compared to a, a normal Japanese resident. So if you're looking at an Australian person who can take his yens out of Japan and get um, 3 or 4% on them uh, in a long-term deposit in Australia, then you really want to substantially increase your return over what you could get in your country of origin um, if you're going to enter the, um, the risk or semi-risk of property investment. Otherwise, what's the point? Well, and, and bring, that touches on what another registrant had asked is, is what are your thoughts um, on currency exchanges? For example, the I'm an Aust the, the question was this, I'm an Australian hoping to invest in the Japanese housing market. I'm wondering if you agree that the current conditions of the carry trade between the Australian dollar and the yen make this an idle investment. How does an Australian get started in the real estate market in Japan? This question focusing on currency fluctuations, what, it, does this have, should this have any impact whatsoever on an investor's decision to buy real estate here in Japan for investment purposes? Not as a long-term strategy. From my perspective, um, exchange rates go up and down a lot. So what seems like ideal conditions this month, um, because the Bank of Japan has announced a new round of QE and the yen's dropped, or um, the Fed's got an issue and the yen goes up again. So these are more factors in deciding when to put your money into the country and when to take it out again, as far as your balance is concerned. But if, you're, if you've decided that you want to invest in Japan, it should be for other reasons, not because this month the exchange rate looks okay, because you never know what's going to happen next month. So um, if it's at, at 100 per US now and you're thinking, wow, that's pretty low, that doesn't mean it's not going to go to 120 or 140 and it might stay there for the next two or three years. So for you to think that um, you're you're utilizing a great situation by, by putting your money into yens at the moment and then investing in property, it might be true. But the basic rule to handle um, a foreign exchange investments in any country, I would say, and in any, any point in time is to... Um, a, not invest with money that you'd need back in a hurry, because once you depend on that money for your income or for your mortgage payments back home or for whatever you need to quickly withdraw it, then you're a slave to the exchange rates rather than being on top of them. So instead of profiting on them, you'll be losing on them. Um, second thing is to pad your transfers and to pad your balances. So when you transfer money across to buy in Japan, add another 10% extra in case the exchange rate suddenly changes and you need to transfer another 500 at, at cutthroat rates later down the track. Or um, when, you're pulling your, when you're pulling your income out of Japan because the exchange rate is now profitable and it's worth to pull your income out, leave 10% behind because you might have maintenance issues. And you want to sign up with a Forex provider as opposed to using the bank's rates. Forex providers will usually necessitate a minimum, I think, of approximately $2,000 in transfers. If you suddenly have to pay $500 to fix an air conditioner and you've got nothing in Japan, you'll be transferring those 500 bucks at um, cutthroat bank rates. And you'll be forced to take whatever exchange rate the market's currently giving you. Um, and that's a recipe to lose on Forex trade as opposed to profit on it. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I've never heard it put so succinctly, actually. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's that, those, those percentages that, that you had mentioned, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say specifically those leave this percentage here for in case of this is those, is that born out of experience your own experience or your, or your clients experiences um, in, in terms of moving money in and out of Japan based on income generated from income generated from investment in real estate well I'm a big believer in spreadsheets so whenever it must be my um, I'm I'm really I suppose I'm an IT geek turned property geek so in the past I used to do IT project management and we used to have to run them um, very detailed worst case scenario, best case scenarios, how, what will happen if you don't leave this stuff behind. So for me, the natural thing to do whenever I plan any sort of investment is to put the numbers down, cut them down by half, see what's going to be the worst case that could happen to me if I don't get money for three months or if some, something suddenly costs as much as I can imagine it might cost. So I would say 10% is the rough mark for big transfers. Um, Catastrophes can always strike. I mean, um, the whole place could be burned down. Your insurance company refuses to pay you out for whatever reason. You suddenly have to transfer $20,000 again. But 
barring those sort of catastrophes, 10% seems to be the benchmark, yes. Interesting. I mean, exchange rates can be your friend and they can be your enemy. If you have planned it in advance and you have and you have padded it, and you have, um, and you have made sure that you're withdrawing when it's profitable, and you're transferring when it's profitable, and not because you've got a deadline to meet tomorrow, um, then you can make a very neat profit on those exchange rate fluctuations. The spreadsheets and the managing of spreadsheets, is this something yeah. that uh, your firm does for clients if they, if they yeah. hire you to? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. And, and the reporting and all that, the reporting back, and, and not, not so much the advising of getting money in and out, but providing investors enough information very yes. detailed uh, worst case best case scenario that's right you guys go through all that with your clients yes we do deal calculators um, we're not shy to tell them if we think they're about to make a bad decision um, people that are chasing high profits regardless of location we would tell them that um, people that would be um, assuming assumptions that wouldn't necessarily be made true we would tell them that and it all comes with detailed balance sheets um, if you keep your balance with us uh, for those of us who cannot open a Japanese bank account, and it all comes with detailed deal calculators, starting off, as we mentioned, with worst-case scenarios, then slowly improving as we near settlement. Um, we also advise on um, diversifying and hedging. So if you're starting off with one or two properties, we would try to steer you clear of um, more speculative locations. But once you've got five or six Fukuoka, Kumamoto, and maybe Nagoya properties, then it might be a good idea to invest in Kitakyushu with one or two smaller apartments because if all goes well, you could get high returns there and you're not limited to the one space geographically. So if the economy takes a downturn in Kumamoto, you've still got apartments here and there. So we do all of that for our clients as well. Do, do you recommend uh, an approach like that when if someone's overseas looking to invest in Japan um, to spread out their risk geographically across the map? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer in um, hedging and diversifying. So. Um, you want to diversify your geographical location, you want to diversify your socioeconomic um, um, spread out. So if this city is dependent on one industry, you don't want to uh, put all your eggs in this basket. You want to spread it out a little bit more. By investing in property, we are already limited in our hedging and diversifying. I mean, we're not buying, some of us are not buying on the stock market. We're not putting it into precious metals. We're not putting it into areas that we're not that familiar with. We like property for whatever reason. We're happy with property. We're already limited, so we might as well diversify within the range that's available to us. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that. That is great insights. And the next, uh, another registrant question is not so much on how do I get the property, but it's very specifically focused on Miyazaki. And it's a great place, Miyazaki. It's nice, isn't it? And yeah. and actually, unfortunately, though, the the person who <coughs> wrote us. Who wrote us this question? Uh, has expressed that uh, Miyazaki has a depressed economy, but has yes. the best weather in Japan. The best weather in Japan. Is there any hope for real estate values in such a market? So you get a great environment with no economy. Yeah, there's always hope. Um, look, there's a few places like that in Japan. Um, Miyazaki, Oita, which is a little bit further north from there, northwest from there, um, Fukui. Places that have got spectacular potential, um, whether it's the weather or the ocean or, or some local um, specialty that they make, um, but unfortunately have not got the governments to match. So if the local government is not doing anything active to uplift the area, like um, Fukuoka City is doing, I'd just like to use that as an example, or, or, um, or like um, Niseko was doing at the time, um, it's not likely to change um, and Japanese mentality takes a long time to change. So I would go to Miyazaki for holidays, but I would not invest there at the moment. You, again, you mentioned Fukuoka, and you had mentioned that Fukuoka is pretty progressive in its, in its stance on kind of bringing, you know, being the capital of West Japan. That's right. In specifically what ways is the government there? being progressive. Is there any one one or two or three things you can point at that say this is where Fukuoka beats out the rest of the cities in the area? I'd say that the um, the town planning is pretty brilliant. I mean, um, they take, for, for instance, um, there's a suburb called um, Nishiku from memory where they've announced, they've allowed a big developer to come in and announce something called the Island City Project. Whether that'll work perfectly or not, we don't know yet, but the initiative of taking a, what was formerly not such a, a particularly well-known or popular suburb residentially and suddenly making a big, uh, uh, giving it a big boost in the form of uh, bringing in a giant mall or, uh, 
holiday apartments or putting up local businesses that were not there before. And really rejuvenating an area is something that is not done in many places in Japan as a rule. Um, second thing I'd say, they're very internationally inclined, so they're actively courting international business, they're actively courting um, international investors and international holiday makers. Um, Specifically how? In the form of tax breaks, in the form of incentives, in the form of rebates? Just PR, advertising. Just PR. Look Simple at Fukuoka. PR. They launch PR projects and, and they, they have advertisements coming up in various big cities around Asia. Well, why don't you come holiday in Fukuoka? Um, even curiously, um, PR generating initiatives that might not physically go anywhere but generate a lot of talk, like um, they were trying to get the next um, Hadron Collider um, scientific thing to be built. In, I think they actually ended up losing to, to Hoku. But they, they, were apply, they apply for this sort of thing. They, they make themselves heard. They make themselves known. And that just... They just doubt they're trying. That's it. And that, that generates interest and it okay. generates word of mouth and just people act on it. Okay. Interesting. And, <coughs> excuse me, another, it, not Miyazaki, but another registrant question had, what's the situation, in your opinion, regarding buying a home or office in the Nagaoka, Niigata area. So now we're talking about kind of in the middle of the country, up in the, over in the mountains. A home or office for owner-occupier purposes? Uh, yes, for, yes. Well, that's got nothing to do with investment, really. I mean, if you're an owner-occupier, the most important thing is where you want your children to grow up or where you want to work or where you want to live. Don't, don't think of it as an investment, I would say, because if you do up the numbers on a spreadsheet on, your, on the home that you're going to live in, you're always going to lose out to investment properties, which might be in a part of the country where you're not even interested in living, or in the heart of the city where you're not interested in, you're interested in the suburbs, and the returns are better in the center. So. Let's flip that then and say for investment purposes. For investment purposes, it is not tremendously known for good deals. Um, I'm not saying it's a depressed economy like those other places that we've mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's actually got a bit of a better PR than those places, but we just haven't seen spectacular deals come out of there. Um, maybe it's because transaction volume is low, and maybe it's because a lot of it is owner-occupied, so we're not seeing a lot of investment properties advertised around there. Um, I can just say that I'm neutral on it. I haven't heard good or bad things about that area particularly. Okay. And along this same thread, the, the, the final question that I have for you is that there's been some recent uh, media attention on large investment banks purchasing properties uh, outside of Tokyo, outside of Tokyo. And, and specifically, one, one viewer had quoted an article on Japan Today uh, titled, Is Japan's Property Rebounds Investors Court More Risk? By pushing I've out read of that Tokyo. one. Yeah. 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 What um, What do you think about this? What do you think about the, this article? Is it Is it? And what do you think about this general trend? Is it true? Is it valid? Is it Is there a future here? The trend is correct in the sense that uh, yes, there is more international focus on Fukuoka now that we haven't had in previous years. Um, the way it was presented in that particular article was a bit. Um, a little bit blown out of proportion from from where I see things. I mean. Um, Property in Japan generally has lost 50% um, of its value or so over the last 15 years. Fukuoka specifically has still got about 13% um, vacancies on the residential units. It's still only risen about 25% or so in the last two years, which leaves it another, I think, three quarters of the way up to go before it reaches anything like those um, pre-bubble numbers that we've been seeing in uh, previous decades. So to say that there's a bubble forming in Fukuoka is a little bit premature, I would say. Um, it is getting harder to find good deals there. I'll give them that much. Um, if we could get 12 to 15 percent around the city center in the past, this is residential. I'm not. Uh, my specialty is nothing to do with commercial, so I wouldn't know about commercial. But residential-wise, we've been getting 12 to 15 percent around the city center when we started out. Um, now we'll be pushing it if we can get to 11. Um, 10 is usually the norm, and most of them are below 10. So we're finding, we are finding it harder to nab good deals. Um, I mean, 10% still gives you a fair bit of a nice margin to drop to in case the economy takes a hit or, um, or rents. I mean, when rents go down, it's usually because something's happened to the economy and then your costs go down as well, um, subjectively, maybe not to the same degree, but they take the load off the... Um, the loss that you're taking on the rent. 
for things to go down to the point where you would be losing your investment value, say for it to go from 10% to 5%, which would be, I don't know, equitable with Tokyo in some instances, I think the whole of Japan would be needing to take some hits. It wouldn't be a, um, a city-specific thing, unless natural disaster hit or such, but that's got nothing to do with economies and bubbles. So I think that particular article was a little bit over the top. I don't think the situation is even nearly that grim in Fukuoka. Is there a potential? Are there potential seeds for a bubble to develop in Fukuoka? Do you think? I suppose you could say that about any hot market anywhere in the world. Um, wherever people are interested in, and big institutional investors start moving in, then you could say that if they don't watch out in five or ten or twenty years' time, there could be a bubble there. But I mean, where isn't like that? We've got the biggest. Um, bubble in the world just around the corner in Hong Kong that still hasn't burst for some obscure reason. So to call Japan that's um, only been exhibiting uh, um, price, very modest price sizes, price sizes for the first time in about 15 years, to call anywhere in Japan bubble potential I think is pushing it a bit. Excellent. Any last words that you want to say? Well, no, well, invest in yeah. Japan. It's a great country and it's got the world's best cash flow hands down for a stable environment like this and the only reason you haven't been hearing about it is um, maybe because um, their PR isn't that hot but um, it's a great country to invest in. Asians know it and I highly recommend the West wakes up to it. They already have been but come here we'll get you a good deal. Excellent. Zip, thanks very much. It was a very, very enlightening hour. Pleasure. And I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And thank you very much for coming up all the way to Tokyo from Fukuoka. If you want to get in contact with Ziv, uh, please go to his site. The link is below this video. Uh, jump over to his site and give him a call. He's waiting for your call and waiting to, waiting to talk to you in detail like he did in, with us in this video. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, without you guys, we wouldn't have a reason to do this. And thank you, the Queensland Business Centre, for hosting us. Uh, very, once again, if you're looking to get some shared office space in a great location, we're in Kamiacho in the heart of Tokyo's business district. Uh, give these guys a call. It, the number, all the contact info is right behind Ziv there. I'm Adam German from realestate.co.jp. Thanks for watching and bye for now.